So we'll have a minute or two for some folks to join, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll start uh, kicking off here. Recording this, so um, maybe folks uh, got busy and uh, you know are, are uh, waiting for the recording link. So I will get started at about uh, 11.04, 11.04. this again just a second. Well, why don't we get started? Let me see uh, the PowerPoint again. And put this in gear here. We're we're gonna, so um, the rest of the folks can kind of uh, kind of kick off. So, Plans for Cyber Risk Governance, or also known uh, AKA the uh, ACRG. We started this, uh, this initiative uh, November 2nd, I believe, is when we, we officially kicked it off, and the idea uh, was very well received, um, you know, both from uh, the participant standpoint uh, as well as the press standpoint. Uh, we had uh, you know, well over uh, 40 people crammed into uh, a room at the Hilton in uh, downtown New York City to kind of kick the idea and everything off. Um, so the CRG, and you can get the, uh, uh, the charter from, uh, from ARG.info. It's science on cyber risk governance. Um, what we put together is not-for-profit, peer-driven organization comprised of senior risk leaders. And I'm talking senior risk leaders. I'm not just talking technology risk. I'm talking, uh, you know, everyone from uh, we've got some CFOs on board, some chief risk officers, some CEOs. Uh, we've got the business aspect represented as well as, uh, you know, from, from various different industry verticals, uh, folks that, that deal with risk in, uh, you know, not just the technology risk realm. Uh, folks that can kind of help us, you know, correlate things and, and uh, put them in the proper perspective. So, driven by senior risk leaders, the Alliance's purpose is to establish a stand framework for risk measurement, reporting, and governance. Uh, holistic cyber risk management and support is dependent on uh, different regulatory industry standards, 
you know, across the board. So we need to develop a common security metric framework and translate uh, those metrics and those events uh, into actions that we need to move forward on. So uh, in layman's terms, uh, we need to make technology risk more understandable to executive level and senior management uh, and the boards. Um, right now, uh, you know, boards of directors uh, and senior, uh, uh, senior managers and, and executive leaders, they understand other areas is a risk very, very well because they've learned that in business school. They've applied those principles over the course of their career, and, and, and you don't get to the C level without understanding how businesses operate. Um, and so, you know, understanding how businesses operate, they have to have a great understanding of, you know, everything from reputational risk to credit market risk uh, to, uh, you know, in some instances, uh, aspects of operational risk and things of that nature. But they don't understand technical risk. Um, I've been uh, doing this for Oh, just die side of 20 years, and I've been, uh, you know, well, as, as the SFO perspective, uh, technology for about 30 years. Uh, I've got about 26 in IT, and about uh, close, close it up on like 18 as a chief security officer. Uh, Main financial services in a, um, industry, but um, you know, I've had uh, plenty of experience in, uh, in other industry verticals as well. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed in reporting to the boards. Uh, is that uh, they don't understand technology risk. Technology risk has been presented to them in the past as kind of voodoo. Uh, it's uh, you know more of a hey, we're secure, trust me type thing. But uh, the underlying uh, values that you know that they're used to dealing with just don't translate well uh, as far as you know the, the technical terms go. So if you've got see so that's breaking to the board, you know, vulnerability counts and patch levels and things like that. That's, that's just mumbo jumbo. Um, and I've seen it time and time again. Um, so one of the things that we've got to do is uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, talk at the table with other risk leaders, uh, you know, sharpen our crayons and, and take the propeller out of our cap and kind of translate this into risk terms that they can understand that relate well with other areas of risk. And I think that that's, you know, kind of a, a strong point of where we're going with this. We're not getting this off, and, and we're not implementing this just because we don't have anything else to do, <laughs> uh, or be, because uh, you know folks will come up to you and say, you know, oh, well, great, another standard. I've already got 20 standards that I need to follow. This is not just another standard. This is a, this is a common framework, and, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, to kind of report compliance against your standards, you've, you've got to interpret the results, and that's what we're hoping to do. Kind of put the right interpretation concept text together, uh, a framework that can be applied to, uh, you know, any, any standard that's out there, be it, you know, if you're using NIST, I mean, nobody has to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, um, that's why we've structured this a certain way, and, and I'll kind of go into, uh, you know, how we've structured it to cover uh, just about any standard that's out there. Um, usually, in my experience, you wind up with, you know, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, scoring sheet based in Excel with pie charts and all this stuff, and you're having to do this, you know, the seat of the pants translation into business terms, uh, generally, you know, the week before, you know, the board meets, and you, you've got to go in there and explain this stuff. Uh, that's, that's not, you know, conducive to a lot of situations, and that, that just doesn't hold well when you're trying to uh, put your best foot forward. Uh, and, and in order for information security in particular uh, to have a seat at that table, we've got to be more business-like. We've got to, like I said, we've got to take the propeller off the cap, and we've got to make things understandable at the end of the day. Another key point, uh, a lot of board members and execs, they see the same things interpreted differently, or they in turn interpret differently, right? Lots and and uh, a lot of you folks can can understand and, and identify with this. You know, when you get hit with an audit point, there's probably you know maybe five different ways or more that you can interpret that audit point. You know, okay, well we can meet or exceed the audit point if we just do X. Well, you know, it, that might not be what the auditor you know has in, has in mind, and and certainly a lot of the things that we present to executive management and the board level are not exactly what they have in mind. Um, so it's setting a framework and setting a context and, and so that uh, you establish credibility with them. Uh, another point, a lot of organizations have to conform with one, more than one standard and, and the one to many, uh, but you don't want to have to 
you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater every single time some other standard comes out or some other uh, regulatory uh, uh, thing comes out that's going to impact you. And, you know, I'll use GDPR as an example, right? There's, you know, I guess that's just like uh, any other, uh, you know, uh, a regu regulatory standard that says, all right, don't run with scissors or, or something like that, you know, is, is going to be represented in there, all right? I've already got 11 different standards that I have to comply with from the regulatory perspective. Each one of them in one point says, hey, don't run with scissors. Now, how do we map that uh, so that we're not checking this thing, you know, 10 or 11 times? Uh, so if you've got a framework and, and you've got a framework that correlates different standards into something that executives understand, that you understand, that's uh, not only quantifiable, but qualifiable, uh, you, that's the intent of it. RG Working Group. So the RG Working Group will play a pivotal role in advising the Alliance, gather recommendations, accelerate the framework's development, and uh, accelerate adoption. Um, last count, as far as the ACRG, uh, the Alliance membership goes, uh, we had about 78 members from, you know, all walks of life. I'm hoping that most of them will, will kind of uh, tune in or, or uh, you know, read the uh, or, or listen to this webcast uh, at a later time, uh, just to kind of get a good reminder and a refresher as to what it is that we're, we're set to do. Um, so we've tailored this with four working groups uh, aligned to four focus areas of, of cyber risk governance. Uh, and these are the four that, that we're establishing. Uh, these groups uh, include informed, secured, governed, and resilient. Now, we have the base ACRG, uh, which incorporates uh, these four groups. So the, uh, the recommendations, uh, the, the metrics, the standards, and the situations that are all developed uh, within these four groups are going to be correlated to common baselines and mapped to other areas of risk at the base committee level. If I start too fast, uh, somebody please, you know, raise your hand. <laughs> so, uh, an integrated governance framework enabling transformation to a cyber risk program. This is how we envision um, those four groups, you know, playing a role in the, the overall uh, uh, strategy and, uh, you know, execution towards other risk areas and, and making sense of technology risk, right? So you have the informed group. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an advisory function uh, which assesses ongoing business needs, aligns the cyber strategy, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read verbatim word for word. Um, you can go ahead and, and uh, if you want to copy up this uh, slide deck, please send an email. Uh, it went out in the, uh, uh, the email that I had sent as well as listed on the website uh, as well as um, uh, probably uh, over uh, our company website as well. Uh, Ken.file at technocracy.com and I'll send you a copy of this. Purpose pillars. Uh, the four that we are envisioning were the four groups. Uh, the informed. So the group is going to look into uh, you know how well uh, how well aligned cyber strategies are the corporation business needs, and then uh, we'll determine you know where limited risk visibility uh, exists. So uh, from the uh, from the informed aspect of things, uh, that is uh, understanding the whole holistic nature of your technology risk and, and your technical security program. Uh, I, I, that incorporates, you know, everything from, uh, you know, from, from knowing, uh, you know, in the now from, uh, you know, uh, baseline reports uh, to uh, strategy to, to things of that nature. It's just keeping informed of what is going on uh, throughout the enterprise. Aspect of things. Pillar. We'll look at state of security and compliance, cybersecurity technology. Um, and why these solutions are, are falling short in meeting the objectives of, of protecting, uh, you know, the business information, uh, it would be it uh, classified data or business plans or, or just about any other, uh, you know, we're in business uh, in the InfoSec world to, uh, to protect data, right, uh, and, and protect from, you know, from unauthorized access, uh, be it inadvertent or intentional. Um, so uh, the secured pillar, and I'll, I'll show this in another slide. The secured pillar includes the actual state of security of, of various different things. Um, 
um, you know, from, from system security, which includes, you know, everything from endpoint configuration to uh, um, you know, just, uh, you know, the state of individual systems. Uh, and, and so this is going to be a, a more technical aspect. Uh, or a more technical working group, I think, uh, than it is, and, um, you know, from the, I guess, from, from a technical perspective, this is going to be a, a more uh, propeller uh, on, in the cap uh, type of group uh, where we're going to list out the actual uh, state of security of, of various different things uh, and then take those objectives, those metrics and everything. And, and we'll correlate that. I'll show you the, uh, the three-tiered uh, security metrics um, uh, that we've put together to kind of, uh, you know, structure and validate this and kind of answer things as we go. I'll show you that in a moment. The governed, uh, the governed uh, group. We look at corporations, current risk metrics, use cases, and success maintaining use visibility of cyber risk posture and compliance adherence. So, uh, Things included in, you know, the, the typical governed framework are uh, areas of compliance, um, you know, in certain aspects of, of, uh, of the RC will apply to this, uh, but also uh, control baselines uh, and, and some of the other standards that are at play, right? Like I said before, we don't want to go into uh, a situation where we've got, um, you know, uh, looking at 11 different things or, or 11 of the same things 11 times. Resilient or resilient uh, group. Uh, this group will look at corporations' cyber attack readiness, response, restoration capabilities, uh, identify current disconnects, and you know preventing uh, companies from from improving in these three areas. Uh, so everything from uh, incident response, uh, forensics, uh, recovery, uh, disaster continuity, business planning, uh, you know, the resiliency aspect also uh, takes into account the testing of the state of readiness of, of these different given areas. Here's where to some of the meat of the framework as to, you know, how we've developed it uh, and how we're intending to move forward on it. So we've spoke of the four groups or, you know, or four service areas or four service pillars, uh, however you want to refer to it. Um, within those pillars, uh, we're going to have uh, critical intersections, right? You're going to have, if you think of the, the ISO uh, model, um, you know, the, the ISO model has layers. Uh, well, uh, this model has, um, you know, technology layers or, or technology intersections. Um, so we've got the entity, uh, and the entity can be, you know, anything from, from uh, you know, anything that has a persona, really. Uh, the entity doesn't have to be just a user account. The entity to be, you know, a... a uh, uh, a particular service account or just, uh, you know, in, in today's case, you know, uh, a certain persona that you, you've enabled for a particular purpose. The device aspect kind of speaks for itself, I think, um, you know, everything from, uh, I guess, uh, you know, laptops, endpoint servers, um, you know, portable computing devices, uh, the, the actual physical nature of something being, you know, placed on the next layer, which is the network layer. Uh, and that's essentially things that are happening on your network. Uh, the application, of course, um, because we have other aspects and other areas of technical security to contend with, like application security. Uh, you know, application is, is also a, 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 a critical intersection. Uh, then we have the data itself and, and, and the value of the data that's provided and, and protected and, and how we're going to, based on um, these other uh, intersections, try to protect that. Uh, of course, you know, we have the platform that everything sits in. Um, so uh, when we start correlating uh, those, uh, those six across the four service areas, we have uh, 24 segments approximately where a piece of technology could exist or where, uh, you know, something uh, or a process even that could exist uh, to protect a piece of data across these four dimensions. Now, so sections. When I speak of this, uh, this these are common functions uh, that are typically done within those four, four pillars, and I gave, you know, a short example example before, um, you know, from the informed services, we're looking at total risk visibility, uh, compliance adherence, uh, new, new application and 
uh, and data requirements and registration, uh, but all the business units focused predictive analysis and reports on risk and compliance. Those those are all a part of you know staying uh, informed of your overall risk uh, within technology, right? Security services, uh, we have you know everything from infrastructure security, um, security architecture implementation. Uh, application and data security, the the state of it, um, you know, are they configured properly, are they not, uh, you know, are there holes in it, that sort of thing. Um, governed services aspect and, and the governed compliance aspect of things. Um, you know, we have monitoring of, the, of the, the security effectiveness per whatever your security plan is or your roadmap. Um, we have compliance management and escalations, uh, scoring and, and escalations as well. Risk awareness uh, and agile threat uh, agile threat prevention, uh, and, and those are things that are kind of um, you know, in most organizations, I'd say uh, leading edge or bleeding edge, right? Um, if you remember back in the days when when uh, you know Gartner announced the the death of the IDS when, you know, because the first IPS came out, well, <clears throat> you know the first IPS is an example of, of agile threat prevention. Um, but as we all remember, that didn't work out too well in most organizations because it would, you know, block everything down there, uh, and it's created more business problems than than it was worth at the time. But as technologies mature, and as uh, people you know, get a handle on how to deploy things, uh, how to keep, uh, you know, things as part of the, the bigger objective and, and part of the bigger roadmap, um, you're going to see more and more, uh, I guess turn the corner uh, uh, leading edge type solutions like that. Uh, resilient services. So this resilient services, uh, like I said before, is the state readiness, right? And that's the, you know, uh, staying resilient. And like I said, it, it includes everything from, you know, from incident response and, and recovery to, uh, and business recovery and, and things of that nature. But it also includes, you know, vulnerability scanning, network security testing. Um, these are things that you need to do and, and that many companies are mandated to do. These are things that you need to do in order to uh, test your resiliency and, and test your recovery, right? And I know uh, FSI SAC uh, sponsors a, 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 a walkthrough, a, a a, a big test um, once a year where many companies participate and they throw out scenarios and and uh, you know companies uh, you know try to uh, uh, see how they comply with that scenario and and, um, you know, and that's just one example of things um, we also have application security testing you know, in there um, you know it's it's one thing to say hey I built an application but it's another thing and, and definitely quite another thing to have the principles uh, ingrained throughout your SDL, uh, SDLC. I, I think the new buzzword and buzz terms for that are DevSecOps now. Um, <laughs> so it, it seems that things that we should have been doing for the last you know, 20 years or so um, are now, once you tag it with a buzzword, they get really cool and people start paying attention. Um, you know, I, I traditionally have referred to it as you know app security within the SDLC. Um, we have penetration tests. All companies are, are having to do uh, you know either yearly or bi-yearly you know attack and pen tests from from third parties just to kind of shore up the resiliency and, and get a third party perspective as to you know uh, how they could potentially be uh, attacked or, or penetrated. Uh, and the last point that uh, I had already mentioned was uh, forensics and readiness evaluation. Um, so from the forensic perspective, there, there are a number of things that uh, companies are doing, uh, you know, both in-house uh, as well as with help from a third party. Now, how you look at that um, and how you operationalize that uh, is largely, you know, business and, and, and uh, security plan dependent. <clears throat> but um, we're hoping to pull, um, you know, some core metrics out of that to be able to map that back into the overall framework. So the next steps for this um, of the ACRG. So we're we're soliciting uh, participation in the subgroups. Uh, those those four pillars, uh, and either based on uh, core competency uh, and capabilities 
or uh, uh, participative interest. There's nothing saying that you know if you want to participate in four groups, if you've got the time to give to four groups, uh, by all means, uh, you'll have a more you know well-rounded perspective, and you'll have you know obviously a bigger voice uh, in how everything comes together at the end of the day. Um, so what we want to do at the end of the day with ACRG, and incidentally, the ACRG is uh, our way for uh, incorporation as a 501c3. Um, so we're, we're doing that so that we don't have, um, you know, folks um, worried about a conflict of interest or, or things of that nature. It kind of makes it a little easier to participate, you know, in, in an open standards group, and it does, you know, uh, that could be something that could be perceived as, you know, uh, proprietary. Uh, there's nothing proprietary around this. Um, we developed this framework. Um, and we developed it, you know, as something that that we can work forward uh, with. Because one, uh, we found that there was no really substantial or uh, no uh, available way to do those one-to-many and many-to-one mappings of various different compliance objectives. And you know, if you look at your typical company uh, today or your typical large organization, I mean, they're they're not just Sitting in one uh, one business or one industry vertical, either. I mean, there are many different industries and, and verticals, but you know, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel every single time. When you know, if you've got a good program and you're doing things the right way, or, or that appear to be the right way, um, you know, you want to stick with that. And if there's a, a chance where you can uh, gain some operational efficiency, you want to go with that route. Um, but the, the point of that. Uh, is that we're, we're not just going to become just another standard. We want to, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, make this into uh, an OASIS standard that's generally accepted across all industry verticals. So that's the that's the end game. That's the end goal that we want to do with that. Um, and, and and of course, you know, um, you know, we have a uh, we have a platform that incorporates some of this called uh, Intellecta. Uh, and you know, obviously, we're we're going to take. Um, you know the feedback, and we're going to take the standards that are developed and everything, and we're going to operationalize that into into our product as well. Um, so it's kind of a win-win thing. Um, so each working group, um, we're going to confirm security technologies as the first step to be considered in their respective dimension. You know, across those six areas of concentration, right? Um, uh, the entity, data, platform, application, network, and and uh, and, and those. Sets. Um, so, and then we're going to document what value it provides, you know, from the uh, both uh, the operational aspect as well as the technical impact. And then I envision, uh, you know, setting that up and, and relating that to other areas of risk. Because, you know, the, it, let's let's face it, there are systems that um, you know are going to be running in your enterprise that are not, you know, uh, infosec related. Uh, they're not compliance related. Uh, you know, or or, or you know, they're enabling the business in some shape or form, but uh, as a product of what it is that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, they can contribute to, um, you know, identifying risk areas. Uh, you know, ML systems, uh, for, for example, uh, they typically, even though they may typically be handled in a lot of companies, you know, by compliance systems, that's going to give you, uh, you know, a, a, an avenue of risk identification that really should be you know included in your holistic risk management program. So we're going to define uh, standardized situational use cases, you know, per area of comp uh, uh, concentration for the respective dimension. What that means is um, the use cases and, and situational use cases are things happen, right? And things can't happen in the enterprise. Uh, things happen at the technical level. They have they happen, uh, you know, operational level. They happen. Um, you know, at, at uh, uh, you know, other different levels, that if one situation that's a risky situation in your enterprise, and, and you know, and it's enough for it to actually become a use case or something that you know you need to actively prevent against, we want to identify all of those. Um, but we also want to identify, um, you know, the uh, the systems that enable you to see that. Uh, as well as uh, you know some uh, objectivity in relating really that to other areas of risk. Uh, fine tune the uh, the methodology for risk quantification, uh, other met uh, and, and other metrics. Um, and, uh, there are a few different, I guess, what, what, what's called.
evolved uh, standards for technical risk management uh, out there. Um, but they are purely quantitative, and they are purely, you know, um, infosec uh, type standards, right? They are for just measuring. Uh, they're not for relation, right? Um, so what we want to do is uh, not only do we want to, um, you know, have quantifiable metrics, but we want to have relational metrics as well developed at the end of the day. So, you know, like I said at the, at the top of this, um, we want to, um, you know, provide uh, a framework that relates well to other areas of risk. And I don't, I have not seen in, you know, my, my nearly 30 years in, in IT, uh, a system that comes close to that to where I'm not having to go into the board every three months and, you know, with the, with the whole Excel sheet and fuzzy little pie charts and sharp and crayons. So um, this, this will enable us to do that a lot more effectively. The thing is, is cross-correlating cyber risk governance with other related areas of enterprise risk, right? That's, that's something that I just elaborated, uh, I think, ad nauseum for the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. As far as um, that presentation, what I want to do is I want to a security model, right? So a model that um, we all developed over the years, and like I said, uh, you know, uh, about 19 years as, as a as a CISO, uh, and having to uh, you know translate the various different metrics frameworks, um, we come up with uh, this three metrics model, right? Uh, and it's originally derived from from the switch metrics models like ISM3. Um, if you remember the uh, the 800-55 NIST publication, the special publication on security metrics, um, there are some uh, incorporated standards from that, uh, as well as uh, you know ISO 27001. If if, uh, if you're an NSR and you're dating yourself and you remember, you know BS double seven double nine, that's where that beast came from. Let me slow down. Let me do a slideshow vote here. So in order to have security metrics best practices, right? You you have to have a, a very wide view, but yet a very narrow view, right? Uh, and the only way to kind of develop that perspective is to kind of have a, a three-tiered model. But why do we have security metrics? Well, we have security metrics essentially to answer questions, right? You've got questions that you need answered, be it either, you know, operational implementation level, um, you know, the, the minutia uh, type metrics of, uh, you know, or, uh, let's let's say uh, you're you're a SOC analyst, right? You're going to want to know, okay, has my workload increased? Uh, you know, uh, do I have more vulnerabilities or do I have more attack attacks? than I did, you know, three months ago, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so the operational and implementation level metrics will bubble up to answer questions that you need from, from the business uh, and, and the management level, such as, you know, are my staff adequately for the tasks at hand based on the, the amount of minutia that I'm getting, uh, and, and, you know, and a host of a uh, whole other questions. Those things uh, are used for interpretation at the most senior your levels, right? The, the board level, uh, the senior management level questions, and I'll show you some of those here in just a second. Um, but in order to have the right alignment, right, like I said you've got to have uh, a, a wide view but yet a narrow view, right? Um, if you look at the, the whole big box uh, as risk management perspective, that's going to include all your areas of risk or all your identifiable uh, areas of risk throughout your enterprise. Uh, that includes risks and business processes and, and, and things of that nature as well. All right. um, technology and information security uh, or technical security uh, has traditionally been a part of operational risk management over the course of many, many years. Even the Basel standards that, uh, that are out there for op risk management um, you know, dictate uh, uh, you know technical risk, uh, and, and I think um, the last calculation I had heard from someone was that you know, it, it, the technical risk equated to roughly one third of uh, overall operational risk. Uh, you know, which which is a which is a fair amount. Um, so your your IT risk uh, will sit within operational risk, but then you'll have a certain part 
uh, of your whole IT risk uh, falling under information security. In order to balance this effectively, you've got to look at different, uh, different views as well. You've got to look at not only the operational effectiveness, but you need to look at uh, the architectural view as to, you know, uh, how, how uh, implementable the technology is, what the efficiency is, and, and what the actions are that you need to incorporate something to, to make a difference, right? Um, then you also have to gauge, you know, what the business value is of things, right? But honestly, you know, if, if you're going to go out and, let's say, uh, you're, you're uh, the loss expectancy on a particular, uh, you know, situation, all right, uh, is, you know, I'll just throw out a number, you know, $1 million, right? If you're going to spend $3 million to implement that particular technology just for that one particular use case or situation, then there is no business value to it, right? Unless you can maybe squeak it and, and squeeze it and, and, uh, and, and lay it to different areas and kind of um, say, all right, within five years, you know, if we're kicking the can down the road over the next five years, this is, you know, the gradual decrease. But um, you know, which large and, and fair, you know, if you present something to the business and, and it's going to far exceed what it is the value of something it protects, you're not going to do it. You're not going to. A smart security executive is not going to make that decision. Um, and then, you know, the, the, um, the whole uh, macro system approach, right? Like I said, we've got other areas of risk that we need to identify and, and, and kind of, you know, uh, get a handle, but uh, that we need to relate our, our technical and, and, uh, and security risk into. Alignment with the business. This is just, uh, you know, a, a short start of, uh, you know, a bubble up method would traditionally work, right? And then I showed you the box uh, in, in, the, uh, in the previous slide, right? Um, we've got, we're drowning in operational and implementation level methods. But they all mean something at the minutiae level. They all mean something, you know, on a day-to-day -day level. Now, it, it, some of the uh, operational and implementation level metrics, you know, you're going to see where they would fit within one, uh, one or more of these working groups, right? Such as, you know, uh, in, in the governed aspect, right, we would have a number of systems that are in compliance, you know, new policy exceptions, you know, that sort of thing. Um, within the informed, you know, you'd have uh, pre-production security assessments for applications, uh, you know, within secured firewall issues, you know, user ads, changes, deletes, you know, like I said, the more propeller in the cap type minutia. Um, you, you'd also have, you know, um, you know instances of, uh, you know, from, from your perspective. Uh, from the resilient uh, aspect, you know, system cover, but you'll see all of those, um, you know, a number of uh, reported incidents, uh, investigations on the use, investigations resolving, not root causes, or you know, things of that nature. So, um, as I stated before, you know, we can use this minutia to answer the questions within the next layer, which is the, uh, the management. And, and IT level uh, uh, management uh, questions, you know, like are our security services effective? Um, you know, how is our compliance with the policy? You know, that we have viruses, spam, and et cetera, et cetera, under control, you know, uh, and the resilient, uh, resilient aspect, you know, do we have effective incident response? Are we ready for a disaster? <clears throat> Those are all management level questions that, uh, you know, as manager and, and within IT and, and occasionally within the other areas of the business, you're going to get asked those questions questions, um, you know, especially, you know, what is our cost savings of budgets and return on investment, or, or is the, the mythical character uh, return on security investment. I've got, I've got a, a unique uh, take on Rosie uh, <laughs> for a number of years, and uh, maybe if we uh, sit down and, and uh, you know, have a beer at some point, I'll, I'll give that to you. Um, but uh, those questions, in turn, like I said, are going to bubble up to uh, board level and executive level questions that need to be answered. Right? Uh, I think, you know, first and, and foremost, you know, uh, are we spending wisely? Are we spending enough? You know, how sure is our program? And there comes that whole capability and maturity model thing that, you know, you derive from everything else within your enterprise. You know, based in you know, at a snapshot in time, right? In compliance and does security support all uh, all critical business processes. So that, in a nutshell, is um, you know a, a base model um, that we can go with. Uh, you, know, you start somewhere, right? 
we think that we've you know kind of thought this through uh, very very well, uh, and you know we're going to um, you know move this forward and, and develop it over time because uh, you know the value that we that, that that we're able to provide from this group uh, is is phenomenal. I, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, speak with uh, uh, with Beth Petro from uh, the Wall Street Journal a short a short while back. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, that he really hasn't seen in this particular capacity yet, and, and I fully agree with him. Um, so that, I'm going to uh, open this up for uh, for questions. Looks like we have uh, uh, any questions here, but if we do have any questions, please uh, you know just uh, pop them into the chat, or you know like I said, uh, if there are any questions as a result of this, you can contact myself Ken P F E I L at techdemocracy dot com, or you can uh, contact uh, Gotham Dev uh, G A U T H A M dot deb at techdemocracy.com. Okay, well, folks, uh, I really appreciate uh, your time, and uh, um, look for next steps and, and participation. We're going to have a few kickoff webcasts or kickoff uh, webexes uh, starting next week, um, and that that's going to kind of uh, piece together um, the individual uh, working groups uh, across those four verticals. Thanks again.